Welcome back. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch and a good opportunity to network and meet some of the other folks here uh, who are in attendance today. I'm going to try to keep the um, great level of presentations we've had already um, and not reduce it too, uh, too much in terms of quality because the presentations have been really phenomenal. I hope you're all enjoying them. And if you're not, just don't say anything <laughs> in response. Um, but I'm sure, you, I'm sure you are. And there's a lot certainly to be gained from listening to our terrific speakers we've had already. Um, I have a sort of a different topic to talk about to kick us off this afternoon. Um, one that's, I guess, a little bit more social uh, than it is just based on decisions alone. And I'll start by just sharing a story. When I was um, just graduated from college, I worked as a social worker in a homeless center in downtown Oakland. And it was actually a pretty, pretty hard job. I found it pretty challenging. But I was also uh, partly inspired by the work that was done there and thought about two options, you know, pursuing a PhD, which seemed like a strange uh, uh, alternative, or pursuing a career in, in administration for human services. And so in part of my search, I talked to a couple different individuals who were executive directors of some local nonprofit organizations in human services. And one of the questions I remember asking them at the end was, you know, what, is it, what, did, you th what did you find surprising about this career path that you didn't expect uh, would be so important or such a, such a big aspect of it? when you originally got down this, this path. And both of them mentioned, one much more sort of uh, vociferously than the other, uh, mentioned this one particular thing, which I thought was really interesting. They said, well, in this kind of job, you really have to be OK with asking people for stuff. Because a lot of what you do is you ask people for stuff. You know, whether it's asking people for charitable donations, of course, uh, or asking people who work for you to do more for less, or asking other organizations to cooperate with you to share resources, et cetera. A lot of your job is often asking for stuff. And for some of us, that's harder uh, than it is maybe for others. In particular for me, so I chose an academic career <laughs> instead of going <laughs> down that path. But I've always been interested in the process of asking people for things. And so uh, recently, I've done some work on the experience of asking others uh, for stuff, or asking others for help, asking others for a favor, whatever the case is. And I can relate this back to our current experience here today, at least my own experience, because to put this conference together, one of the things I had to do was ask these presenters to come and present today, which was n really terrifying for me, a sort of a nerve-wracking experience, because I'm really asking them for a lot to be here today. I mean, as I'm thinking about the experience, all I can think of in my mind, of course, is all the reasons they would not do this. So, uh, number one, I'm asking them to make a big trip, uh, take time out of their day to travel, in some cases, across the country uh, to be here for a day or two days, what have you. In addition, of course, they have to do some work uh, to put together a presentation to share with all of you while they're here. And of course, finally, they may be leaving behind loved ones uh, as well, who it's hard for them to sort of <laughs> let go of or you know, have some detachment from. So this is a, a big ask, certainly. And I know just the natural calculus people sort of use in thinking about these situations is, of course, they're no doubt thinking about how, how likely is it somebody will say yes when I ask them for something. Uh, because there may be all sorts of reasons why they would say no. And the extent, this matters, because the extent to which people feel like others are likely to say yes, they're much more emboldened to ask. But the extent to which they feel like others are more likely to say no, of course, they're much less likely to ask. No one likes to be rejected. So this becomes a very fundamental social question uh, in interpersonal interaction because you would assume, naturally, people are pretty good at guessing or judging whether others are likely to say yes when asked for anything. Because a few things. One, we've had a lot of experience asking people for stuff. Two, we've had a lot of experience being asked for stuff. This is one perspective taking uh, instance where we actually do know what it's like to be in the other role. And in addition to that, we have lots of incentives working toward us being accurate. One, we want to minimize the social costs of rejection. We want to maximize the instrumental benefits of getting cooperation. So everything would point to us being really good at this judgment. But what I'll suggest, along with a colleague of mine, Vanessa Bonds, who's worked on all these studies with me at the University of Toronto, is that people are actually really bad at this. And they're bad in one specific direction, which is they grossly underestimate how likely people are to say yes when they ask them for stuff. That people are much more likely to say yes than they think, despite having lots of experience having asked people for things in many other situations or cases. And the reason that is, we suggest, is because the kind of things we think about when deciding whether to ask somebody for something 
aren't necessarily the kind of things that other people think about when they're being asked. I described for you what I was thinking about. All those things that I mentioned were sort of like, I don't know, I guess I'd call it you know, the costs of saying yes, that they'd have to sort of bear all these costs if they were to come out here and give this uh, presentation. But they could be thinking about it much differently. That is, they could be focusing on the cost of saying no. Um, you know, they want to think of themselves as a, a, a generous person, somebody who's able to sort of come through on um, uh, requests, et cetera. And so they want, are motivated to say yes. Maybe there's some benefit to saying yes, you know, some, some warm glow we get from helping others, whatever the case might be. But that's not what I'm thinking about often when I'm thinking about asking people for stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that this generally holds in most cases, but there are some cases where we can manipulate this uh, effect by changing up the types of requests we're making, the way in which requests are made, or the context in which they're posed. So I'm going to start by walking through some demonstrations, some field demonstrations of this underestimation effect, the fact that we underestimate how likely others are to say yes to requests for help. And in addition to that, then I'll sort of look at a field study which um, uh, tries to shed light on an underlying mechanism for this effect, why it actually happens. And then if I have time, and it hopefully will, I'll move into some extensions, looking at cases where we're not only asking people um, for help, but we're asking people who've rejected us previously for help and seeing how accurate we are and guessing whether they'll say yes in those cases. And then finally looking at cases where we're not only sort of um, looking at whether we're estimating others' willingness to help, but estimating others' willingness to seek help and see how good we are at judging that as well. So um, in each of these studies, I'm going to sort of walk through quickly. Uh, what we do, what we set up is um, a real task where people have to, have to actually go out and ask people for stuff. So they come into the lab um, and they're told, listen, this is you know, what you got to do. You're, you're going to have to go out on campus or go out in the city and randomly or just approach each person who happens to be walking toward you and ask that person for something. But before you do that, we're going to ask you to make a guess or an estimate about how many people you got to ask before you can get X number to agree to do it. So they're going to sort of make a judgment about how willing others are, on average, to agree to this simple request. Um, now, we only do this in about half the cases where we have people make estimates just because we don't want people's predictions to affect their behaviors. We want to test to make sure that's not happening. And in fact, we have uh, plenty of evidence to suggest that it doesn't happen in this case. Um, afterwards, we, of course, compare their predicted rate of compliance versus the actual rate of compliance they experience. Now, in this first case, we have them go through a pretty contrived task in which we bring them in and we say, listen, we want you to go out on campus, um, approach every person coming uh, you know, closest to you, and ask them if they'd be willing to fill out a questionnaire. We show them the questionnaire. It's two pages long, you know, relatively straightforward. Um, they've got a clipboard with five questionnaires. They've got to get five people to agree to do this before they can come back and collect their money. So before we send them out, we ask them, how many people do you think you're going to have to approach before you can get five to agree to do this? And I ask you this question in your mind. Uh, just come up with a number. How many people do you think you have to approach before you can get five to agree to this request? This is New York City um, and Columbia campus, uh, so just give you some context. And they're just sort of randomly approaching these folks. So get that number in your mind. Um, I actually think that's a pretty interesting uh, number to have. Um, so we ask them for this information. They go out. They make these requests, um, encounter these uh, folks sort of just randomly. And they're asked to follow a script where they can only ask them, excuse me, uh, would you be willing to fill out a questionnaire? That's it. Um, and then see you know, how successful they are. So in this case, when we ask them to do this, again, they've got to get five people to agree. Their predictions are um, as follows. They think it'll take about 20 to 21 folks on average. They'll have to ask in order to get five people to agree to this request. So in other words, one out of every four people will say yes. In reality, every other person says yes. One out of every two. Every other person they encounter uh, says yes. So they are grossly underestimating how likely people are to say yes when they ask them for stuff. Which is interesting, of course, because here's the Looking. favorite <laughs> thing again. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. Actually, no. Um, so, sorry, that was weird. Um, so here's the, here's the funny thing. One of my colleagues, uh, Jeff Pfeffer, really, he likes one particular aspect of this study, which he says is uh, like in the footnote, but he loves it, which is how many people dropped out of this study, 
which was a big number. Like 20% read the instructions, and they're like, oh, no, I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go do the marketing study instead, for sure. Because uh, this, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, because, you know, this looks daunting. There's no way you're going to get five people to agree to do this. And just the sheer daunting nature of the task was intimidating enough to them. Imagine how high their estimates would have been if they were actually in the study. So, so clearly people grossly overestimating in this case, but this is a pretty contrived case. I mean, how much experience do you have doing something like this? Not much, unless you're a graduate student or an academic looking to get people to fill out surveys. So some very um, nice reviewers of this uh, work um, suggested that we run additional studies, um, as they're inclined to do often. And in this case, uh, they looked for, they want replications with realistic requests. And I thought that was a great idea. So we thought of a couple different requests. Uh, one was, Imagine you were just walking around campus and you needed to borrow somebody's cell phone. Um, in this case, we want to get you to get three people uh, to allow you to borrow the cell phone. They have to then take the phone, call back to the lab. We can call our ID their phone and check to make sure they're actually doing this. Um, so they have to go out and do this task. A third, a third study, we actually had them, this is on Columbia campus as well, we put them in the middle of campus and we had them approach people and ask them if they'd give them an escort to the campus gym, if they'd walk them to the campus gym. This is actually a pretty interesting request because it's uh, completely believable because the Columbia gym is subterranean. It's very hard to find if you've never been there before. And it's about three city blocks, so it's a somewhat significant request to, uh, to walk them over there. Um, the other advantage of this particular one was we had issues of trust in our lab group about whether people were really following along with these instructions um, or whether they were sort of picking out the softies uh, who they could see walking by who'd be more likely to say yes and going for them. So we, we, had a, we had a man in the bushes, basically, for this task, uh, who was tracking people and make sure they were actually complying with the instructions, which, which they were, uh, which was great. So, so we send them out. In this case, they've got to get uh, three to agree for the cell phone request or just one to agree to walk them to the campus gym. Now, the questionnaire situation, they overestimated, in this case, about two to one. Uh, they thought it would take about 20 to get five. It only took about 10. In the cell phone case, they got to get three people to agree. They think they're going to have to ask a little more than 10 people on average. Uh, in reality, they have to ask six in order to get three to agree. Um, in the case with walking them to the gym, they think they're going to have to ask about seven or eight people on average. In reality, every other person says yes. Two they have to ask. So huge overestimation there of just how difficult this task is going to be to get somebody to agree to do this. So people think it's much less likely on average that casual interactions with strangers where you ask them for something is going to lead to some success. This is one of my favorite experiences of ever interacting with a reviewer in the uh, um, scholarly review process because one of the reviewers on this paper relayed a story at the beginning of one of his reviews in which he said, thanks very much for this paper because it bailed me out of a recent situation I had where I was running late for dinner with my in-laws and normally I would have never, I didn't have my phone on me, I was at the train station, I would never ask somebody normally to borrow their phone but this certainly Made, it seem, made me feel more emboldened to go ahead and save my behind by calling ahead and letting them know I was late. Uh, it was a very collegial moment, like in the review process, which was great for, for academics. Um, yeah, right, then they wanted to reject the paper. <laughs> that's right, no, that's right. Um, but to be fair, these are all, of course, experimental uh, studies which are contrived. Uh, and so I still wanted to find a situation where there's a naturally occurring help request and see whether or not, even in situations maybe where people aren't strangers, but they're familiar with each other, would you get the same general effect? Because we could imagine that you're not very good at judging somebody you never met before, but maybe you're pretty good at judging people you know quite well. So we uh, wound up working with an organization called Team and Training. Uh, how many people here know Team and Training? Heard them before? Oh, that's pretty big. All right, great. <laughs> so we've got maybe about 20% who don't, so I'll just explain really quickly what this organization does. So, um, team and Training raises money for leukemia and lymphoma research, and the way they do that is they enlist uh, people who want to run a marathon or a triathlon to raise money on behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Now, you get in exchange some training for your fundraising efforts. You get training from actually highly qualified coaches, and you also get the social support of working toward this uh, goal with other people. So um, we worked with this organization um, in New York City uh, in their place there, but we wanted races around the country, so we actually selected uh, people who were doing races in Florida, Chicago, Washington, and, and somewhere else, I can't remember where, um, just to get some geographic variation because people were also concerned about whether this was really a New Yorkers aren't as bad as you think bias uh, in, our, 
in our studies. So we wanted some geographic variation. So what's nice about this particular organization is that they also have fundraising diaries or fundraising logs which we can track and make sure that the self-report data we're getting is actually valid uh, and not being manipulated in some way that suggests some socially desirable responding on the part of participants. Uh, in this case, we recruited people who just went to a seminar uh, and decided they were going to sign up for team and training. Uh, and they could rate, have, they were going to be asked to raise a significant amount of money, anywhere between $2,000 to five or $6,000 that they have to raise um, to participate in this race. And they agreed to sort of uh, keep this fundraising diary uh, along the way, tracking everybody they ask, everybody who comes through, and then we also have the actual results of their fundraising from the organization as well. So it's really great context for us to look at what we're studying. Great also in a couple more respects. This is a really conservative test of the hypothesis I just put forth. Think about it from this perspective. One, these are familiar others that these folks go to to ask for stuff. And they're asking for money from people they know well. Family and friends, for the most part, make up the list of donors here for this organization. They're not random strangers, usually. Number two, very conservative test, largely because the folks who signed up are the ones who thought they could do it. The people who didn't sign up were those who probably thought it was far more daunting. These results would certainly be more likely to be supported if we had those folks in the sample, but we don't. We're just looking at uh, the people who actually signed up for the study. So in this case, we asked them all sorts of questions in the beginning before they start the fundraising process to see what their estimates are like, what their um, expectations are like. And when we asked them, you know, how many people is it going to take for you to reach your fundraising goal? Um, you know, how many are you going to have to ask to reach that goal? They think it's going to take about 200 or so asks, 200 or so people they have to approach. In reality, it takes a little over 100 that they have to approach. Again, we're seeing this two to one ratio a lot here, which I'll come back to perhaps later at the end. Um, but we also asked them to make this prediction lots of ways. We asked them to make this prediction also in terms of what percentage of people will agree to make a donation. They think on average, maybe 30% of folks they ask will make a donation. In reality, it's closer to half the people they ask actually make a donation. And here's some funny things, because I, I really was intrigued by these data. I wanted to see if there were um, things we could do to look at the percentage of family and friends they were asking. Would that make a difference that when you're asking people you're more familiar with, you're better at judging if they'll say yes? No, didn't have an, an effect, stranger versus um, friend and family. One interesting difference uh, was in this particular sample, there are people who sign up multiple times to do team and training. So about 15% of the folks had done team and training before. They had actually done it even the past year, sometimes the same race. Uh, so they clearly had a lot of experience in this particular role. So we wanted to see in this case with these folks, are they still <laughs> likely to underestimate compliance? Yes. They don't underestimate as much as the people who are doing, doing it for the first time, but they significantly underestimate how likely others are to say yes, even though they just did this thing previously. So it seems like a pretty robust um, bias here. And of course, what we're thinking is, well, you know, this could be really useful. And certainly that's why the organization was willing to participate with us, because they also thought it could be pretty useful. Um, you know, what they decided to do was to take the results of our study and basically show people the results when they were thinking about signing up for team and training. Uh, because, you know, they run a lot of these seminars and a lot of people say, that sounds great, no way am I signing up for that. That looks really hard. Um, I'm going to have to do something else uh, with my volunteering or whatever the case is or find some other way to participate in this race. So what they did is just decided if we show people that this is going to be a lot easier than you think, of course they're going to be more likely or more emboldened to sign up because all that sort of worriness, worry, <laughs> worrying about being rejected, about sort of struggling through this effort is going to be um, dissipated to some extent. But in addition to that, are also sort of interested in whether or not our explanation for why this happens actually holds water um, in the sense that my, my take on it is that when people are asking others for help or assistance or a donation of some sort, they're really focusing on like, how big is this ask? I mean, what's, this, what's the magnitude of this ask? Am I asking for a lot here or am I asking for a little? And thinking about how likely the person is to say yes. But in many cases, it might be different for the person on the other side. What they're thinking about is not the cost of saying yes so much as the cost of saying no. How awkward would it be to, for me to say no right now? How, how, you know, sort of, how bad would I feel? How uncomfortable would I feel if I had to say no right now? And I don't factor that into my calculus as the help seeker or the person requesting help. And so to test this idea, we went, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
uh, if you ask the veterans how many people they asked in the last campaign, do they get it right? So are they, do they misremember how many no's there were, or do they just think that going forward it will be difficult? You know what I'm saying? So right, because they maybe have to say, uh, I got to go to like a bunch of new people yeah. um, as opposed to go to the same people I went to before. We don't know for sure because the reality is they do go to a lot of the same people they went to before, but we don't know that's because they, they were thinking about going to some new people, but they said, oh, this is going to be too hard. I better just go to the old people I went to before. So we don't know. We can't rule out that that's actually the process they're going through is they're thinking this is going to be a stranger interaction, but it turns out it's not <laughs> a stranger interaction. Don't have a good answer for that. I'm wondering if, if when somebody says no, it feels twice as bad as somebody who's saying yes feels good. Right. <laughs> and so when you're thinking back, Absolutely. When, when I ask you how many people you ask, you're getting it wrong, but you're actually accurately reporting your emotional experience yeah. in mm -hmm. some way, right? So it was right. twice as bad. Absolutely. Like that. But people misinterpret that as being the number of people rather than the pain mm -hmm. of asking the person. Absolutely. So we, I mean, one case we've asked people to sort of like recall episodes of non-compliance versus compliance, and they will write tomes on the episodes of non-compliance and what their reaction was like <laughs> in that situation or how painful it was, et cetera. Uh, versus cases where people have said yes. I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a concern that we have that we sort of maybe exaggerate in our minds, like how great these social costs are, maybe exaggerate in our minds. Um, we're so averse to them, uh, you know, we're really good at, at convincing ourselves that it would be so terrible to encounter them. Um, so we wanted to, s to see if this explanation makes sense, so we went back to our original paradigm of the questionnaire task from study one and ran some manipulations. Uh, in this case, a couple of the manipulations that we ran involved the size of the request um, as well as the directness of the request. So rather than ask people to fill out a two-page questionnaire, we asked them to either fill out a one-page questionnaire or a ten-page questionnaire. So a really small ask or a really big ask in terms of how much time they have to spend on this thing. And then we also manipulated whether they were asking them directly, would you fill out this questionnaire, or rather indirectly, by giving them a flyer that has it written on it, would you fill out this questionnaire? and wanted to see if this affected people's expectations of how successful these means of asking are going to be. And so um, well, we, <laughs> we have them go through this. They're in, again, one of four conditions. Either they're asking for a small thing directly, asking for a small thing via a flyer, asking for a big thing directly, or asking for a big thing via a flyer. Um, so we replicate our effect that when we have the direct request here, uh, people are assuming it's going to take far more uh, individuals to get one person to agree than it actually does um, by a significant margin. But the exact opposite is true when we use the indirect request. People think that the flyer is going to be relatively almost as effective as asking somebody face to face. Um, but of course it's not. It's not even close. Uh, for the most part people take flyers and throw them away. People take emails and delete them. People take all sorts of indirect requests and they ignore them pretty effectively. But we don't factor that in when we're making predictions about how they're going to behave. Because we're not very good at judging how, s I guess, socially constrained somebody is in choosing whether to uh, act in the way we want or not. Um, what's interesting is that when we look at their estimates according to the size of the request, um, they're very sensitive to that. So, you know, their requests change according to whether they're going to, um, or their estimates change according to whether I'm asking them to collect one-page questionnaires or ten-page questionnaires. I think there's no way people are going to fill out these ten-page questionnaires, but in reality, people are not that significantly less likely to uh, fill out a ten-page questionnaire versus a one-page questionnaire. If they agree to one, they're actually pretty likely to agree to the other. And when we play this out over the different conditions, we see the sort of pattern we expect that sort of goes along with our, explain, or our psychological mechanism that the people who are asking are th thinking about the, the magnitude of the request. How much is this I have to ask for? But the people who are being asked are thinking about how awkward would this be to say no. Um, if it's really direct, it's going to be really hard for me to say no. If it's very indirect, it's going to be relatively easy for me to say no. Now let's, uh, let's I guess, take this into context and think about how this can be applied. Um, so I got a um, call once from a, this guy who ran uh, a campaign for uh, food banks uh, for an organization called, I think, Second Harvest. Um, and it was called Check Out Hunger, something like that, I think it's called. Uh, and it's basically, um, you've probably seen these cards before at grocery stores. You walk up to check out, and there's like three cards usually on the left. 
do you want to donate a dollar, three dollars, five dollars, et cetera, to go along with your purchases to support uh, uh, the food banks, local food bank, et cetera. And this was in um, upstate New York. Programs weren't going great, so he wanted some advice about you know, how to change it to make it more effective. And all his questions were asking me about what should the amounts be? I mean, are we asking people for too much here? I mean, is, is one dollar too much? Are we asking people for less? Maybe we should be going pay as you go, uh, or you know, like pay what you want. Um, you know, there's something about the magnitude of our request that's, that's wrong. And I said, you know, just from my personal experience, I don't think that's it. Um, I think when I go, you know, to check out my own experience going to the grocery store, I'm almost never asked by the checkout person, would you like to make a donation? Maybe one out of four to five times I actually am asked although they're required to make that request of people who are checking out. Um, and he said, well, do you think that really makes a difference? I said, yes, that definitely will make a difference, more so than manipulating the size of these donations will. Um, and I haven't actually heard back from him uh, yet whether um, you know, his attempts to sort of uh, get them more in the mode of asking were effective, but I was really struck by how I thought he was focusing on the wrong thing in terms of how to make this program more effective in raising money for food banks. So I think that's part of the application is how do we think about the way in which the ask is made in order to sort of get um, a more favorable response to what we're trying to accomplish. Okay. A couple other things uh, I want to mention as extensions. Um, one is what about the worst situation where you have to go back and ask somebody for something who's already told you no. And as I'm an editor of a journal right now, uh, or like, a, you know, editor of a journal where I have to ask reviewers to review things who love to say no all the time, and I have to go back and ask them repeatedly, no, seriously, can you do it this time? And it's, it's a terribly awkward thing to do when somebody's already rejected you to have to go back and ask them again. But what is our expectation like? Are we so averse that we always just sort of sort those people out? Well, I'm not going to go back to those folks who've refused me in the past. Are they actually less likely to say yes in the future, or maybe are they more likely to say yes in the future? I would suggest that it's actually hard for people to say no, um, as we suggested before, and they may in some cases be more motivated to say yes the second time around, but my expectation is the opposite, because I think the person who says no once, more likely to say no the second time. So I definitely don't want to go back to that person. Um, so we ran a couple um, studies to look and see whether this was the case whether people are pretty bad at judging if uh, past compliance is a good predictor or past refusal is a good predictor of future compliance. And so we asked people to make estimates of, you know, what do you think the effect is after we ask them to assume a role either as a um, person who's uh, asking someone for help after having been refused or being asked for help after having refused someone, what do you think the likelihood is this person that you will say yes or that this person will say yes in response to this request? And what we find is that people assume, who are adopting this sort of role as a help seeker, having to go back to somebody who said no in the past, that they are far less likely to say yes. They're more likely to say no. Um, but the opposite is true for those who are thinking about it from the perspective of the person being asked. No, I'd actually be more likely to say yes if they came back to me after I've already said no, because I feel bad about having said no in the past. So my temptation as a person in this role is to, let's take this person out, because I don't want to go back to them again when in reality, they might actually be a somewhat attractive uh, ask for me. So we, again, tested this in a live uh, demonstration, actually here on uh, Stanford campus, in which we uh, wanted to see uh, if we could get this effect in an actual situation. So we went to Tresseter uh, Union, which is our sort of student union here on campus, and um, Dan Newark, who's uh, worked with us on this project, uh, had to stand there in the middle of the student union and as people were walking by, asked them to fill out a questionnaire. And we were only interested in the people who said no, basically, to filling out the questionnaire. But enough people did, certainly, that we got a, uh, a pretty good um, sample size. And what we did was, after they said no, I won't fill out this questionnaire, is Dan asked them, okay, that's fine, but can you do me a favor? Um, can you uh, take this envelope and just mail it on your way? Because the, the post office is sort of like on the way. Do you mind just dropping it off in the mail for me? And we wanted to know, in this case, like what percentage of people would say yes to a follow-up request after they just refused a request. And then also wanted to see if people read about this situation from the Dan's perspective or read about the situation from the person walking by's perspective, what would their estimates be? And so when people read about this situation uh, from 
the perspective of the help seeker, who's Dan, um, the graduate student, they gave uh, an estimate of, you know, maybe 34% of people will say yes to that follow-up request. But when people read about it from the perspective of the person walking by, they thought about half of people would say yes to that request. Big difference uh, in terms of their opinion, having just sort of manipulated that one aspect, whose perspective are you thinking about this from? And in reality, it's about 44%. So these people are more accurate, these folks much less accurate, underestimating how likely somebody is to say yes when they've said no before. They think that no is a pretty good predictor of future no's. If you've heard it once, you're going to hear it a second time. So maybe it's not worth it to you to go back to people who've refused you in the past. So one of our sort of cautions we would give is that um, it might be helpful to think about a broadening pool of people you can potentially ask for resources, uh, a broadening pool that includes those who've said no in the past. Um, sounds very counterintuitive, I recognize that, but it actually might be uh, something that's effective. The last set of studies um, that I want to go through look at another extension, which is uh, help seeking. I've talked a lot about predicting help, uh, helping, um, but I want to talk about how people predict help seeking. Um, and my expectation is that the exact opposite happens, that whereas people underestimate how likely people are to say yes when they ask them for something, people grossly overestimate how likely others are to ask them for something. That is, we think that um, maybe as a manager, it's great to have an open door policy because people will gladly come in and ask us for assistance whenever they need it, but we are pretty bad at overestimating how emboldened people will feel to come and ask for assistance. And in social support organizations, this is a huge issue. You know, how much usage are you going to get out of this, the services you offer? So one example of this I can think of is um, a great meta-analysis of bullying studies uh, that was done in Europe which looked at the, um, the success of uh, bullying programs in getting students in schools to use, to use the services that were offered. And sadly, even though there's nothing wrong with the programs themselves, they were actually pretty effective for the most part in providing assistance. A staggeringly low number of students would use them. And of course, they didn't have any insight on why they weren't using them. They were just sort of offering conjecture. And of course, what's the first thing people think of why they're not using them? They must not think it's very useful as opposed to, I would suggest, is that they find it way too awkward to go and ask for help with being bullied. But as the person who's the one who could potentially help someone, we often think that instead it's something about they don't see the potential value in this help that I'm offering them, when really it's just, it's too darn hard or awkward to ask. So in this case, we look at um, a pair of situations in which people are in a role where they're expected to provide help. One is uh, RA, uh, TAs for various courses um, uh, around campus, everything from biosciences to the humanities. And uh, these are all folks who are paid to be teaching assistants, and they have almost all of them TA'd classes before. So they have lots of experience in this role. We also took a sample of second year uh, MBA students who volunteered to be peer advisors for first year MBA students. And in this case, it's really interesting. They're not being paid, but they were students themselves in the same situation as first years the previous year. And we wanted to see, you know, over the course of a semester, how many times they were approached for help and how many times they assumed they thought they would be approached for help. And so when we um, asked them this, again, they grossly overestimated how likely people were to come ask them for help. The MBA students who had to track this actually as part of their peer advising program, track how many students came and asked them, Whereas they thought about 14 or 15 students would come ask them for help, it was only closer to uh, seven or so students who came and asked them. Um, but for the TAs, uh, even though they were literally TAing the same class the year before, again, overestimated how many students would come ask them for help or assistance. So what's going on here? Well, interestingly enough, when we asked the MBA students to explain, why do you think these folks didn't come to you for um, help? They said, well, what can I really do for them? I mean, I can't really offer them that much assistance, you know, to help them out, as opposed to it would be really awkward for them to come ask me. Now, as first-year students, when we surveyed the first-year students and we asked them, why didn't you come use this program more, um, they said, well, it'd be really hard for me to come ask a second-year student for help or advice, as opposed to I didn't think it'd be that useful. So the person who's the helper thinks it's all about perceived utility. The person who's the help seeker is just, no, it's all about social awkwardness. 
And so they're just completely missing each other in terms of what the, how to make the system work uh, or to integrate it. We ran this um, scenario study in which we wanted to see if we just got people to think about being a help seeker or think about being a helper, would we get the same effect? Because you could imagine there might be some self-selection bias in that previous study. And so we asked them, you know, how likely do you think it is an individual would ask for help um, in a simple sort of scenario situation where they were in need of help? And sure enough, um, you know, these are just simple equal status situations. You have to go ask a colleague or a peer for some advice, whatever the case might be. And it, in this situation, when they're asked to think about the perspective of the person who'd provide help, they think it's far more likely that the person will ask for it than if they're asked to think about the situation from the perspective of the person in need of help. What explains this um, is their perceived uh, discomfort. How hard is it, how awkward is it, uncomfortable is it, embarrassing is it to ask somebody for help? The person who's thinking about it from the role of the helper says not nearly as embarrassing as people who are thinking about it from the role of the help seeker think it is. So you know, that actually explains our effect, um, that they're not judging awkwardness. They're not judging social factors nearly, um, or weighing them nearly enough in thinking about what prevents people from asking for assistance. We designed one last study in which we looked at sort of like it, maybe an intervention here, or think about an intervention in an organization that had a mentoring program. And so we were um, trying to sort of manipulate a couple different things here. Are you thinking about this from the perspective of the uh, person who needs help or the person who can provide, sorry, person who can provide help or the person who needs help in this mentoring program? Manipulate their perspective but then also manipulate whether or not the um, encouragement to participate in the mentoring program focuses more on the instrumental benefits they can get out of it or focuses more on downplaying the social costs of being in this mentoring program. And so it's either sort of saying things like mentorship will really help your career versus um, you really won't be bothering me. And so when we run these uh, conditions, what we expect to find is that mentors are going to think that the really effective approach is the one that focuses on the instrumental benefits. You want to get people to ask for help, tell them how great help will be, and you will get them to ask for help. But in reality, um, it's the downplaying of social costs that gets people to ask. And that's, we sort of wrote out this sort of fake uh, memo to them, uh, and that's exactly what we find, this flip, such that when we emphasize the comfort, uh, rather than discomfort, of help seeking, the people in the potential, uh, uh, those in need of help, the new hire role, are emboldened to ask for help. But those who are in the mentor role think, no, nope, the way to go is to focus on those instrumental benefits. And so it's just completely missing the boat here in terms of what's driving behavior in this social support program. That um, you know, this social support program is going to work because I focus on encouraging people to think about how much they're going to get out of it, as opposed to focusing at, uh, on getting them in the door. Okay. Um, again, sort of the same explanation in terms of the perceived awkwardness. They just don't see it as awkward when they're thinking about it from the helper's role, but of course it's so awkward for the people who are thinking about it from the other perspective. Interestingly enough, um, when we ask them to come up with attributions for what's going on here, uh, when they see low rates of usage, uh, those in the role of the mentor think that, well, they must not have thought it was very valuable, as opposed to they must have felt it was awkward to ask for help, but the reverse is true for those who are in the position of needing help. So I think there's a lot of um, potentially important insights in the context of asking people for stuff, largely because so much of what people have to do in um, human services organizations or other types of nonprofit and public service organizations is to ask people for stuff or to get other people to ask for stuff or to somehow get other people to ask for help themselves. But a lot of those barriers to asking for help or um, uh, agreeing to help aren't necessarily well understood. And so the interventions we design to increase helping behavior should be tweaked <laughs> so that they're actually more in line with what those social or psychological barriers might look like. Okay. Um, so I'll stop there. Any qu take a few questions uh, before I take off? Thanks very much, by the way. Great. We've seen quite a few studies about the attractiveness. I know we sort of made a joke about this earlier, the attractiveness of the questioner sure. affecting the outcome. Have you controlled for that? Um, other than trying to make sure that I don't have, uh, well, uh, try, <laughs> that I don't have just one person asking who might be like higher or lower on attractiveness, but just to have lots of different people sort of posing these requests. 
Um, and we don't find, uh, in cases where, of course, a lot of these studies are, have random assignment, but we don't find much uh, evidence um, to suggest that's really what's explaining our effect. But I do remember one case where I had, um, <laughs> uh, so I, I ran this one study in Penn Station, which I really uh, like a lot, but haven't been able to publish. Uh, but I really enjoy this study, so I'm going to share it. And it looks at scripts in helping um, or asking for help, in which you know, one of the most popular scripts we use is, can you do me a favor before we ask somebody for something? And in this particular case, um, we stop people who are looking for uh, or waiting for a train in Penn Station, probably the worst place you could stop somebody in New York City, right? And ask them to fill out a, just a short one-page questionnaire. And um, in this case, 54% of people who were asked to fill out the questionnaire agreed, to which my wife's response was, which one of your female doctoral students was doing this study? Because um, she really wanted to know uh, which one it was. But, but the reality was, the condition we were really interested in was uh, not when they were um, being, so in this case, I should back up, 54% of those who were asked directly, would you fill out this questionnaire, agreed to do it. But when we threw in that little script, can you do me a favor, pause, wait for the response, would you fill out a questionnaire, 87% agreed to do it. So a huge increase. Not personal connection, it's commitment. So what's the modal response when somebody asks you, can you do me a favor? Any guesses? Sure, sure. Yep, and they say, yeah, sure, what is it? That's the most common response, which is funny, because they don't say, what is it, yeah, sure. They say, yeah, sure, what is it? <laughs> That's the classic example of pre-commitment right there. I don't even know what it is, but sure, I'll do it. Then it's really hard to say, I was just kidding. I really <laughs> don't want to help you out at all. Uh, you know, um, you, can't, you can't really undo that situation very easily. And so if you're like, sure, I'll do the, the questionnaire. Um, so a very sort of simple demonstration of uh, a principle like that that seems so subtle because it's just a very simple little root, rote script that we use. Yeah? Are you aware of any either for-profit or non-profit organizations? I have there are these pictures of phone banks of people making cold calls out into the night right. and either saying, I've got a great investment for you, or right. I'm from the policeman's union helping you know, cripple children or whatever it is that's, that's out there, that they are fine on what their hit rate is? Right. Do you know, has anyone ever... Yeah, come I mean, back to you. What's surprising is that they're higher than you think, or higher than you would think, right? Um, and part of it's that, and they do use this kind of commitment and consistency approach to um, encouraging people to donate. And the funny thing is, I always tell this story in class. Uh, the funny thing is, is I'm, I study this stuff for a living, and yet I'm still susceptible to it, still vulnerable to <laughs> it, uh, which suggests something about me as a researcher. I don't know what it is, but I can't learn from my own work. Because I remember, God, it was about four years ago, I was uh, in my apartment in New York. I got a call from one of these folks and um, caught me a little off guard. I was doing something else to pick up the phone. And they say, oh, excuse me, uh, this is the police. I'm like, it just gets your attention immediately. The police, um, what can I do for you? He says, I just want to ask you a few questions. Do you have a, do you have a minute? Um, I said, sure, absolutely, it's the police. Uh, you know, of course, I got a few questions. Um, so so uh, he says, you know, he says, do you live in a safe neighborhood? I said, yeah, I live in Lincoln Center. Yeah, it's a safe neighborhood, sure. Um, do you think the police help make the neighborhood safe where you live? I'm like, well, yeah, that's their job. Uh, sure, that's, I'm sure they help make the neighborhood safe, no doubt. Do you think the police should be recognized uh, for the good work they do to help make the neighborhood safe? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> they should. I'm like, well, we're raising money for the policeman's ball. Would you be willing to buy two tickets for $50? And of course, I'm like, oh, damn. <laughs> Damn, walked right into that one. And of course, I'm like, yes. Uh, where's my checkbook? Absolutely. Part of that's because I don't want to piss off the police in my neighborhood. But part of that is it's really hard to say no in that situation. <laughs> and so a lot of these attempts, no matter how, um, uh, I guess, like protected people feel um, from these influence attempts, can actually be pretty effective when the directness is increased. And it just becomes really hard for people to say no. Yeah? Do you have any? evidence about what happens to relationships between an asker and ASCII after you've had a situation where you've done that kind of influencing, where you want to maintain positive right. relationships and positive impressions afterwards? Absolutely. I mean, it depends on what the ask is, right? So if you're asking somebody to donate to charity, that's different than if you're asking somebody to sabotage an organization or something, right? Um, this, is a, this is a big key element. And we're focusing, of course, on good things, uh, pro-social behaviors in all of our contexts. So that's a, that's a big difference. But yeah, we'd be concerned about whether or not what we're asking people to do, well, we're asking them to shame others into providing help or assistance, you know, to sort of like trap them into doing good things. And when we're worried about eliciting some enmity on the part of others, right, when we do that, I don't think that necessarily happens as often as we worry it does. My sense is that 
one of my favorite old studies uh, was this one study done in the 60s by a pair of psychologists named Jecker and Landy. And they were just trying to demonstrate this principle of cognitive dissonance, but they did this great study in which they uh, had people who really didn't want to provide help to one individual provide help to them anyway. And as it turns out, the effect that that has on them is it increases their liking for that individual. They didn't really want to help that person out in the first place. They um, you know, weren't necessarily highly motivated to do it, but when they were asked to do it and they did it, the fact that they did it made them much more positively predisposed toward that person viewed them more favorably, supported the cause more, uh, that sort of thing. And so, you know, part of it's whether or not the, the alignment between the behavior we're trying to elicit and the goals we're trying to accomplish are there. And I think that, um, you know, that is often there, uh, enough of it is there that makes that concern about eliciting enmity a little bit less of a concern for me. Yeah. So a lot of us in this room are in the business of asking a lot of favors, <laughs> right? right? So I edited a magazine, much of the content of which is volunteer generated. So, and it's a very difficult thing to do. And so I'm asking, I have a relationship with a person where I'm asking him or her a lot of favors. We have very, very strong norms in our culture about asking favors. There's a norm of self-sufficiency that Kathleen's research uh, weighs it on. Norms about reciprocity. Uh, norm, so you're, and also you're not supposed to really ask someone a favor unless you really, really need it. Um, and also you're supposed to reciprocate. So my question is, I mean, you, you do more than a lot of researchers in that you go and show you can actually ask two times and then that increases the likelihood of the, the second ask getting a yes. But for those of us who are asking like 20 times, like when does it blow up? <laughs> <laughs> if they have caller ID, I'm pretty sure they can just like not pick up the phone if they, if they see your number. Stanford, you know, it, it comes up as <laughs> withdrawal. Nor when does it get I think for the most part, anonymous. often people don't say no alone. They say no because. Um, so there's a lot of information in that no because that tells you whether or not it's um, maybe encouraging uh, you know, a future ask. So no because I'd have no interest in doing that or no because I can't right now, no because I'm constrained in some way. You can imagine going back to that person when those constraints are lifted and they're probably more likely to say yes. I mean, so part of it's like sort of reading the information they're giving you in the no itself. Um, a lot of no's can be emphatic and others can be more um, apologetic. Um, yeah, Dave? Just wanted to ask you a question about general calls for action, mm -hmm. and specifically around kind of volunteer action. Uh, there are, obviously we have a president right now who's very uh, interested very in civic yeah. engagement yeah. and things, and, and uh, there are lots of conversations in Washington about what, what's an, an effective call to action. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me from your research you'd suggest that a general call to get involved, mm -hmm. go out and do something good, is going to be less effective than a specific call to action to sign up to be a mentor right. in your school. Is that well, yes really or no? Or? I don't study yeah. specificity of the request. Okay. I study the directness of the request. Okay. And what the Obama you know, uh, movement showed us is that small group organizing is incredibly effective yeah. for asks. Um, so when you're having like groups of individuals, smaller groups of individuals, make requests themselves of other individuals they know, doing so directly, actually being coached on how to do that, uh, providing them with materials that would help them do that, uh, that becomes an overwhelmingly effective method rather than using some much more sort of distant approach of getting that, that ask across. I mean, they really sort of thought, I think, pretty carefully about how to make this um, uh, more of a home run uh, in their efforts. So I'm eating into Adam's time right now, so I want to be really um, uh, conscientious about that and I just want to say thank you very much again for your time today and I'm happy to talk to you later.